It is Sunday, October 9th, 2016, and welcome to this episode of Code Evolution. Today I was inspired by a friend of mine who was messing around with the number of islands problem that's presented in computer science uh, classes and etc. So I really, this is a fascinating problem because it's so simple, uh, but it's really interesting because there's so many ways that you can approach the problem. Some are more elegant, some are more performant. And so I really felt like doing a walkthrough would be useful for people and just kind of seeing how it's done and some of the techniques that are applied. So I brought up this article on geeksforgeeks.org that basically talks about the problem. And, you know, as we can see here, count number of islands where every island is row wise and column wise separated. So this is one aspect of the islands problem where you take a matrix, a uh, two dimensional matrix, and you try to find essentially which values are adjacent. In this case, it's denominated by an O or an X and where X is essentially land and O is water, right? In this uh, idea of an island. And as you can see here, they kind of preset up an example of this. And the adjacency concept here is simply, you know, up, you know, left, right, up, down kind of a thing, instead of having to deal with diagonals at this point. The problem that ends up still being the same, no matter how you slice it, it essentially is um, a graph, you're essentially graphing out uh, which nodes, you know, and they're adjacent or essentially their siblings um, that are nearby in that graph. Um, so it's, again, they show here's a, a, an example of a small uh, set of a small matrix and here's a larger matrix. Um, and so, we, you know, if you basically go in any further and you read the code, it's it starts to get in what we're going to review, which is that basically you have to track what nodes you've looked at. So you're not repeating a process of trying to count what nodes there are. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through setting up this project, setting up the tests to ensure that our code actually does what it says, and then we'll actually implement those methods. So first things first, we're going to go ahead and create a folder called tests. Okay, we're going to create a, another directory called source, just to keep things simple. We'll start actually by creating our uh, TypeScript file that's going to be called uh, islands. Okay. And then we're going to create a new TypeScript file, islands.test. Okay. And now we've got our actual source and then we've got our um, test file. So what we're going to need to do is set up our example. So let's go copy over the code from here basically just going to grab this as an example. Okay. So I skipped over all the useless bits of me kind of rearranging this around. I think you get the point. Um, we've got a small matrix and we've got a large matrix. I also changed the islands instead of being X and O for like water and land, I changed it to zero and one. It just seemed to make more sense to me. I don't like checking against strings if I don't have to. Um, and obviously zero is a false and one is a true. It's, it's just a lot easier. It's pretty easy to read looking at it this way too. So moving forward, because I want to actually use uh, Mocha for my testing that's built into uh, WebStorm, um, which makes it a lot easier for me to get this done, I'm actually going to quick drive through um, and speed up the video and show you me actually integrating some of the TypeScript types that I need to have as well as some of the npm packages that are required. So the first thing I do is install PowerAssert from npm. Then I get asserts typings from definitely typed. And I show you here that PowerAssert is in node modules and that the name of the package is PowerAssert inside the typings. And then lastly, I install the typings from Mocha. So with all their dependencies set up, we can then move on to actually creating our tests. So the first issue we run into is that WebStorm doesn't recognize describe yet, even though we have all the dependencies installed and including the typings. So simply stated, you could manually type in the typings reference here, but WebStorm is very helpful. All you have to do is do Alt-Enter in Windows, and I believe the same is for Mac. 
And now it includes the reference to Mocha and its types. And the warnings disappear because it now recognizes the describe function that is exposed by Mocha. So next up, let's define our it statements. So before we continue, we need to get the assert keyword up and functioning. And the easy way to do that is we can actually copy this path and change this to assert. Or an even simpler method is if you look under typings, you'll see that there's an index that actually combines the two. So you simply can just remove. And then all of your typings that have been imported are included. So now if I type assert, OK, I'm not going to get any errors from the compiler, but there will be a runtime error because assert actually hasn't been imported. So that's the next step. We'll go ahead and import star as assert from power assert. And now we have our assert dependency in place. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, guy, where's Mocha? How come Mocha isn't imported here? Well, what I wanted to do is also kind of show off a cool feature of WebStorm that allows you to run tests with the click of a button. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that I can create a configuration for Mocha. We'll just call it Mocha tests. And we'll include the tests folder so it won't complain. Click OK. And now we have this happy little drop down configuration that if I click play, boom, it went ahead and it ran my tests and it gives me this nice tree of um, success and failure. And obviously, if it failed, you'd see kind of a red or a yellow um, dot here. But this is great. Like I basically have very little effort and I can see what's going on in my test suite. There's a lot of interesting ways to do this. I won't get into it too much in this video. But this is definitely one of my favorite features when it comes to doing unit tests inside of WebStorm. Now, you could go ahead and include Mocha as one of your imports, and you could run these scripts manually. You could basically come in here and say, I'm going to run uh, Islands Test or whatever. But the problem is, is that you wouldn't get this very happy uh, Mocha runner that will show you a report of your test assertions. OK, so now let's move on to the fun part. What we're going to do is export a function called count islands. OK, and for now, just to kind of set up the interface and start plugging this into our test before we start writing any code. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to return a fudged value. And now we're not emitting any errors for the time being. Then I can come in here and I can say, OK, assert equals 3 is the expected. The actual will be count islands matrix small. And then we can do the same for large. And now our tests are ready to go. So now the important bits, how do we actually count the different islands within the matrix? Well, the first thing is, let's go ahead and set up that we will have a variable count. So there are many ways to approach this problem, but we are just going to start off clean and simple. And we're going to try to for loop through the matrix. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because what we should do is create a function for recursively gathering up adjacent nodes. But here's where we get stuck. What do we pass this function? Do we pass it the value? Well, then how does the value actually know what the adjacent nodes are? So then it even bears to ask, why even have these be local variables? Because we basically need to have the check function be aware of where it is. So let's change some things up here a bit. Instead of putting the let here,
Let's go ahead and predefine all of our variables. Now, one of the most important concepts behind counting these islands is we have to record or document if we've already looked at a specific coordinate or node in our traversal. And so in order to do that, we need to set up our visited matrix. So you're probably saying, well, it's obvious which ones have been visited. It's all the ones that are less than or equal to Y or less than or equal to X. Well, that's not really the case when you're using a recursive function that may have actually gone ahead and looked at other ones along the way. So you could have nodes that have been previewed ahead of time, and therefore you don't need to recheck those because it may have already discovered that there's an island there or discovered that there's not. So we'll go ahead and plug in our check function. Now this is a more outward check function that's basically saying, I'm going to base all my information on what's been provided externally. But we're gonna go ahead and add a function called check xy that's going to include a targeted version of this function. So why have this separation? Well, it starts to get interesting when you consider that we really only care about this instance of discovery when finding islands. So we basically say if check count, okay? So this is the outward function and we don't include any recursive discovery of parts of an island, right? So we need to return true or false for this check. Since the value variable has already been set, we can use that as our return value for the check function. Now at the moment, this setup is going to fail miserably because if we run our tests, we're gonna get a wrong number. We're counting every X in each matrix at this current time. How do we get past that? So at this point, I went ahead and sped up the video in order to save time. And so what you're seeing here is me creating the V row or visited row and making sure that it exists because we have a sparse visited array that needs to get updated on demand essentially as we uh, request for the row. The next thing is, is I go ahead and I implement this check Y functions into both the main check function and the check XY. Then I start moving the code around in order to reuse the already visited code for both functions. Now you might be asking, why am I having two functions? Well, I'll explain that after this segment. Okay, so why two functions? We have a check and a check XY, right? Obviously, check XY looks like it could do the whole thing, pretty much. But to simplify things in a very interesting way and allow for optimizations, if we designate which one is the root check function or the beginning of the discovery of an island and that the check XY portion is just basically the follow-up, we actually can do some interesting things. So there's a very important check that we haven't actually implemented yet, and that's the out of bounds check. We don't need to check out of bounds in here, but we do need to check out of bounds here. Some simple checks that have to be put in place are obvious. X1 has to be greater or equal to zero. And Y1 has to be greater than or equal to zero. Y1 has to be less than matrix.length and x1 has to be less than matrix y1 dot length. So in some ways I might be a perfectionist, but I'm definitely not perfect. And so what we find out here is we run these tests. It basically comes out that it's not counting anything. So let's investigate. So after a bit of debugging, there's one crucial part I forgot. And that is you can't test against the value if it's not an island. And also in the case of our recursion, 
If the value is zero, then we shouldn't continue in that direction. And success. So now from here, we can start talking about some of the interesting optimizations that you can do. So right out of the gate, one of the things that we can do is we know that when we call check, we're inside of a for loop. And therefore, calling for the previous x position makes absolutely no sense. It's a complete waste because we know we've checked that. We absolutely are 100% certain that we've looked at that because of the loop. So we can just basically take this out. So that particular check was just a complete waste. And by taking it out, it makes no difference in the actual result. So if checking left is useless, isn't checking up useless as well? Well, that's right. So now you might be seeing why I have two functions. One is a special case of what the actual for loop is doing. And the other one is once an island has been discovered, then Mapping out that island is the job of check x, y. So what else? Is there anything else we can do? Yeah, actually we can. Because we know that when we call for check x, y here, we've checked one more over to the right, which means that after all the checks are done, we can actually increment x. Now, what did this do? Well, what it did was is that for the for loop, we've already jumped ahead and we don't have to query this value and then run the check function again on something we know has already been checked. So it's possible that you might be thinking there can't be anything else you can do to optimize this. Well, there's plenty you can do. Um, it's just a matter of how much effort you want to put in. So for example, a simple optimization here is we'll go ahead and return a number. Okay. And that number will be the number of entries to the right that have been successful. So in this case, every time we go right, we're going to store this value. In fact, we can simply state so whatever the success was going to the right, it will add another value to it. That way we can figure out how many columns we went over in that row. So if in essence, let's say if there was a large island and it took up a huge chunk, we don't have to tell the for loop anymore to go look at those because we're saying, hey, we already checked those out. Well, now how do we use this? And once again, we've shaved just a few iterations off the for loop by telling the for loop upstream like, hey, I've already checked these things out. Hey, thanks for watching. I really have uh, a lot of fun doing these kind of code videos where I'm unraveling some of these computer science problems. So if you want to see more content like this, please click like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.